The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to NOVA's presentation of Safe Harbor 401k with Christine Hall and Lisa Rodriguez. Before we get started, I'd like to point out the panel on the top right-hand corner of your monitor. Uh, you will see a drop-down section for questions and chat. This is where you will enter in any questions that you may have for Christine and Lisa. Please keep in mind that the Q&A portion of this webinar will be held at the end and they will answer as many questions as time does permit. If time runs out and you still have questions, you can email us webinars at nova401k.com. Right below questions and chat, you will see the handouts drop down. Here you will be able to download today's material. If you are with us today to earn continued education credits, uh, please be sure to stay until the end to fill out our pop-up survey. This will allow us to track your time and participation. Certificates will be sent out within a week for those who have met the time requirements. To view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is Nova401k Associates, or visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you for joining us today. I now would like to introduce from Nova's Defined Contribution Administration, Assistant Team Leader, Lisa Rodriguez, and Senior Account Manager, Christine Hall. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Christine, and Lisa and I want to welcome you. Um, we're looking forward to um, going over Safe Harbor 401k plans. What's it all about over the next hour with you? Before we get started, I do want to just do some housekeeping items. I want to give you Nova's disclaimer. Please remember that the information in this presentation is general in nature and not, attend, not intended to be a substitute for legal or tax advice. Please consult a qualified professional, such as an attorney or accountant, if you need legal or tax advice. Christine, is still on the first slide. It, I'm still on the first slide? On the, yeah, on the title page. There you go. Sorry about that. Are you seeing them now? Uh, yeah. I am sorry about that, everyone. Um, I think I clicked the wrong button. And instead of allowing you to see my slides, I took that away. Here's our disclaimer. Um, it is also in the handout. So if you want to look back to that, and this is the slide that we're on. Um, this presentation does also qualify for Texas CPA credit. And right here is Novo's provider number. It is 009820. You must be registered individually for this webinar in order to receive a cert certification. You need to be present for the entire webinar and complete the evaluation at the end. And you'll receive the certification in about a week. So now getting into Safe Harbor 401k plans. Oh, please note that this presentation, this webinar is just a basic overview of Safe Harbor plans. Um, we could certainly go into much more depth with Safe Harbor plans and you know, keep you in a webinar for several hours, but our intention is just to do an overview. Um, this is a good time of year to do this because this is the time of year when it's important to decide if you have a safe harbor plan, if you will continue to keep it, or if you don't have a safe harbor plan, if this is something that might make sense for you and that you might want to switch to a safe harbor plan in 2024. So our learning objectives for this webinar are um, an overview of common ERISA terms and acronyms, HCEs, we're going to talk about understanding basic annual testing for 401k plans. We'll talk about the history of safe harbor plan design and then identify the requirements to become a safe harbor plan. We'll talk about how to avoid operational problems and how to recognize the annual requirements to maintain a safe harbor 401k plan. And then finally, we will wrap things up by briefly going over NOVA's cybersecurity measures. 
So starting with terms and acronyms. Um, in the 401k world, we like to use acronyms and abbreviations, and sometimes they can get confusing um, if you're not um, in our field. So it's helpful to go over those. The first one, ERISA, that you might hear a lot. That actually stands for Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. And back in 1974 is when the IRS made, had the federal laws set in place to set up qualified employer-sponsored retirement plans. And the ERISA are the laws that govern them. 401k is actually the subsection of the IRS regulations that explains employee tax deferred contributions. So these contributions are often called 401k contributions. Deferral is another name for these 401k contributions. This is money that employees would normally be paid through their paycheck that they decided to defer or contribute to their 401k plan, hopefully keeping it in that plan or invest it for in a similar plan until they reach retirement age. Traditional versus Roth, and this is in regards to those 401k or deferral contribution. There's both traditional 401k and Roth 401k. Traditional is tax deferred contribution. So the employee chooses these contribution because they don't wanna be taxed on the money right now, and it'll go into the retirement plan account for them and remain untaxed until they take a distribution at some point. Roth, on the other hand, are contributions that are taxed. So the employee is currently taxed on these contributions, they go into the plan, and then if the Roth requirements are met, when the employee takes a distribution, the Roth money that is in the plan will not be taxed. ADP, ACP. So ADP stands for average deferral percentage and ACP stands for average contribution percentage. And these are in regards to the employee's contributions for the ADP and the employer matching contribution for the ACP. And we will talk about that more in upcoming slides. HCE and non-HCE. This is, stands for highly compensated employee and non-highly compensated employee. And I will be going over that in detail on the next slide. The next term is key employee. A key employee is an, someone who owns more than 5% of the company or someone who owns 1% of the company and has compensation greater than $150,000 or someone who is an officer of the company and earned greater than $200,000 in 2022. For both highly compensated employees and key employees, these um, differences in the different types of employees are used to do the testing that we're going to be talking about later um, in these slides. For um, the highly compensated employees um, with the ownership, it does also use family attribution. So when Nova asks for your plan um, about family relationships within the plan, that is why um, we ask that. Top heavy is another test that is required um, where it checks to make sure that the key employees do not um, own more than 60% of the plan assets and we are going to be going over that in more detail as well. Amendment is in regards to your plan's document. All qualified plans are required to have a written plan document 
that state the different plan provisions that that plan is using. If at some point you want to change one of those provisions, you'll want to reach out to your NOVA account manager to see if that change makes sense. And then if you're like, yes, that change definitely makes sense for my plan, I'd like to put that in place, then we would do so by amending your plan through an amendment. So now we wanna talk a little bit more about highly compensated employees or HCEs and how you can identify who those people are um, in your plan. An HCE, is an owner that owns more than 5% of the company in the current plan year or the previous plan year. Or it is an employee with compensation in excess of $135,000 in 2022. If that takes place, that person is considered a highly compensated employee this year in 2023. So when looking at compensation, we always look to the prior year to see what employees earned in determining if they are an HCE or not. The ownership also attributes to certain family members of the direct owners that are working for the company. And that would attribute to parents, children, spouses, and grandchildren of that owner. So that's very important when you provide NOVA with this annual census data that you include those family members um, on that data request so that we can correctly identify the highly compensated employees in your plan. Annual testing. So in order to reap the benefits of having a 401k plan, the IRS does require that plans um, demonstrate that they pass these required testings. Um, this is the IRS's way to determine that the HCEs are not benefiting too much more than the non-HCEs. Um, the IRS really wants these plans to be beneficial to all employees, not just um, owner employees or the higher paid employees. Sometimes these tests are also called non-discrimination tests because of this. These tests include the average deferral percentage test, the ADP test, the average contribution percentage test, and the top-heavy test, which we will talk about in detail. 410B testing, also called coverage testing, actually compares the amount the number of people who are benefiting in the plan. So it will compare the number of highly compensated employees of the employer who are benefiting in the plan to the number of non-highly compensated employees of the employer who are benefiting in the plan. And then finally, some plans, not all, are required to do 414S testing, which is compensation ratio testing. Now, if your plan uses W-2 compensation as plan eligible compensation and there's no exclusions to it, this testing is satisfied and it does not need to be done. But if there are any exclusions to plan eligible compensation in your plan, then the 414S testing needs to be satisfied. Um, for example, let's say your company excludes um, cell phone reimbursement, and the only employees who receive cell phone reimbursement are your non-highly compensated employees. If your plan would, if, would like to exclude that compensation, the 414S testing will not pass because no highly compensated employees receive that type of compensation. So excluding that from plan eligible compensation would be discriminatory. Looking at the ADP testing a little bit closer, 
Um, it demonstrates that the plan does not discriminate in favor of highly compensated employees with regards to employee deferrals or 401k contribution rates. Generally, HCEs on average must be within 2% of the non-HCE average. And if the test fails, there's two ways it can be corrected. It can either be done through refunds, which is the most common, or it can be done by giving an additional contributions to the non highly compensated employees, which can be expensive. That's why refunds are typically what is done. Looking at how this is tested, since it is the average deferral percentage, in order to do the testing, we look at all employees who are eligible to contribute to the plan. Now, that means even if an employee like non highly compensated employee three does not make any contributions to the plan, he would still be included in the calculation of the average. So we have two highly compensated employees in the plan and taking their average of what they defer of their compensation, we get 9.5% in this example. And then looking at the four NHCEs, we get an average deferral percentage of 4.25%. In this example, the ADP testing fails because, it ex because the highly compensated employee average exceeds 6.25%. Therefore, to correct this, either refunds would be needed or an additional employer contribution would be needed. Next, we have ACP testing, and that is very similar to the ADP testing, except ACP testing is in regards to the employer match, which also must be the highly compensated employees average of what they receive as an employer match must be within 2% of the non highly compensated employee average. And the corrections are the same as the ADP. It's either through a refund or an additional employer contribution to the NHCEs. The next test is the top heavy test. And in top heavy testing, we look at key employees instead of HCEs. A plan is considered to be top heavy when the key employees own 60% or more of the plan assets. If a plan is top heavy, the plan is required to make generally at least a 3% employer contribution to all eligible non highly comp non key employees. So um, that is a requirement. If a plan's top heavy, the problem can't be solved through refunds. And again, these contributions are required. So you might be thinking to yourself, those tests might be difficult for my group to pass testing, but my highly compensated employees would like to be able to contribute more to the plan and not be so limited by these tests. Um, the IRS understood that. And in 1996, the Small Business Job Protection Act um, provided a design-based safe harbor method to satisfy the non-discrimination tests of 401k plans. And hence, a safe harbor 401k plan. Then in 2006, the Pension Protection Act added an additional safe harbor for automatic enrollment plans. So if a plan is an automatic enrollment plan and satisfies certain requirements, it is called a QACA, a Qualified Automatic Contribution Arrangement. Some of the benefits to having a safe harbor plan is that your ADP and ACP test are deemed to pass. And in most cases, top heavy is satisfied. 
So you can see that's a very attractive benefit to having one of these plans. And because those two, those three tasks are passed, it will allow your HCEs to be able to contribute up to the annual IRS maximum deferral amount without worries of having to receive a refund. In 2023, the maximum deferral amount is $22,500 plus an additional $7,500 for anyone who is at least age 50 during 2023. Now, there are some requirements in order to have this safe harbor plan, obviously. Um, there is a required employer contribution, and that can either be in the form of a match or a qualified non-elective contribution, sometimes referred to as a QNET. Lisa will go over those contributions in more detail. There's also a requirement to distribute an annual notice and that must be distributed to all eligible employees um, 30 days before the first day of the plan year. And it has to give the safe harbor contribution, state the state, state the safe harbor contribution that's being used for that year. Now the SECURE Act did eliminate the need to give notice to safe harbor plans that use the CUNEC since that is an employer contribution that is independent of whether or not the employees make a contribution, but it is still required to be given to plans that use the safe harbor match because on an annual basis, your employees are being reminded that if they make 401k contributions to the plan, that they will receive the safe harbor match. Safe harbor contributions are 100% vested, both the safe harbor match and the qualified non-elective contribution, unless you're using the QUACA design for your plan, then the employer contributions can be on a two-year cliff vesting schedule. The contributions, these employer contributions, the safe harbor contributions also have distribution, withdrawal restrictions. Generally, a distribution can't take place from the plan and until an individual is no longer employed with the company. If the plan allows for in-service withdrawals at age 59 and a half, these contributions are allowed to be withdrawn. And if the plan allows for hardship withdrawals and the employee meets the requirements of the hardship, they can be withdrawn for that. At that, I'm going to turn things over to Lisa because she is going to go into more details on the requirements for safe harbor plans. y'all see my screen? Yep, we can see it, Lisa. Okay, awesome. So I think I might have had it in the wrong screen. Let me see if I can go up one, one slide. I think you have, you're on, it looks to me like you're on the right slide. Right slide? Okay. Good. So um, thank you. Thank you, Christine. So now we're going to go over the three types of the safe harbor options. So the first one is the safe harbor match. And under this option, you can either select to use the basic match formula or select to use the enhanced match formula. Now the formula for the basic match is match 100% up to the first 3% of an employee contribution plus 50% match on the next 2% contributed. And then the match formula, if you decide to go with the enhanced match, is match 100% of the, of the deferrals up to 6% of compensation. And 
if in the event that you actually match in excess of 6%, then the plan will be subject to uh, ACP testing. Now, the good thing about uh, this option is that only employees who contribute into the plan will actually receive a safe harbor match. Now, this option is usually considered like the preferred method when no additional employer contributions are going to be made into the plan. Okay, so the second option is the safe harbor non-elective option. And under this option, the contribution must be at least 3% of compensation. Um, be aware that your employees do not have to contribute into the plan to actually receive the safe harbor non-elective contribution. Now, if the owners are planning on making a profit sharing contribution, they may want to consider electing this option as it will allow them to receive the maximum allocation for the plan year. The good thing about this safe harbor non-elective option is that mid-year adoption is, is now allowed. So if you decide to go with this option, you can adopt the safe harbor mid-year. Okay, so continuing with the second option, the SECURE Act in 2020 allowed for mid-year adoption of the safe harbor non-elective, which means that plans can now amend up to 30 days before the end of the current year to be the safe harbor, to be a safe harbor plan for that year. This only applies again to the safe harbor non-elective option. The safe harbor match cannot be adopted mid-year. Okay, so let's go over this example. In mid-2023, NOVA prepares a mid-year test for your plan. The mid-year test fails, and large refunds are projected for those highly compensated employees. You now have until December 1st of 2023 to amend your plan to become a safe harbor non-elective for your 2023 plan year. This means all the eligible employees will receive a contribution of 3% of compensation for the plan year, and the plan will no longer need refunds. The ADP and the ACP tax will all be amended to pass. Still with the second option, um, like I said, the SECURE Act allowed for, for this option to be adopted many year. Um, if their plan document, uh, let's see, sorry about this. So um, it did allow it to be amended mid-year mid uh, for the safe harbor non-elective. Plans uh, can also be amended up to December 31st of the following year to be a safe harbor plan for the previous year. And this is only for the safe harbor non-elective option. The safe harbor match cannot be amended mid-year. So in this example, let's uh, assume that NOVA prepares your annual testing. Testing fails and then large refunds are due for those highly compensated employees. Uh, you have up to December 31st of 2024 uh, to actually amend the document and become safe harbor for 2023. Now, all eligible employees will receive a contribution of 4% versus 3% simply because you're making that election after the end of the plan year. So you'll still be allowed to amend the plan. The only difference between this one and the prior example is that the safe harbor non-elective contribution would be 4%. You would be deemed to pass the ADP and ACP testing and no refunds would apply. Okay, so moving on to the third option that you can select to become a safe harbor plan is the QUACA uh, option. Under this option, you can either elect 
to do a 3% non-elective contribution to all your eligible employees, or you can elect to do a, a tiered matching formula that's equal to about 3.5% of their compensation, and that's only if the participant actually defers at least 6% of their compensation. So the tiered match formula for the QUACA is typically match 100% of the first 1% of compensation, and then match 50% up to 6% of compensation. And again, using that formula, if they're doing the 6%, they'll end up getting about a 3.5% of compensation contribution. Okay, let's go over a couple of examples. In this first example, we're gonna go over the the basic match uh, contribution. So let's say an employee has compensation that's equal to 50,000. They make deferral contributions of 4,000 or 8% of their comp. Using the basic match formula, they would get a contribution that's 100% of the first 3% they deferred, and then 50% of the next two they defer into the plan. So with that being said, the first tier will end up being about 1,500, and the second tier, match 50% of the next two, would be about $500 for a total match of $2,000. Okay, moving on in this example, we'll cover the enhanced match. Still using compensation for an employee that's making $50,000. They defer $4,000 into the plan for 8% of their comp. The enhanced formula for that, for the safe harbor would be uh, match 100% of the first 6% of pay that they defer. So based on the above numbers, the contribution would be about $3,000 if they if you let the enhanced match. Okay, in this third example, we're looking at the safe harbor non-elective contribution. Employees compensation is fifty thousand. This employee didn't actually contribute into the 401k plan, so their deferral election is zero dollars or 0% of pay. Their non-elective contribution will be 3% of their compensation and regardless if they're contributing or deferring into the 401k plan, they would still be eligible for that 3%. In this case, it turns out that 3% of comp would be 1,500 that they would be receiving. Okay. Now let's go over uh, the vesting requirements. So for the safe harbor match and the safe harbor non-elective contributions, they must be 100% vested immediately. For the QUACA option, um, you may elect to defer the vesting until year two. So what that means is that anything under year two will be 0% vested, and once that employee completes their second year of service, they will become 100% vested. Now, for all the other contributions that are allowed under your, the plan, which we're talking about maybe like a discretionary match or a discretionary profit sharing, you would have to follow the regular vesting schedule for those types of contributions. If you're not sure what it is, you can definitely check the plan document to see what the vesting is for, for each of those contributions. Sometimes they're the same. Sometimes they might be different for the discretionary match versus the discretionary profit sharing. Now the QUACA, the QUACA option has certain requirements that you need to be aware of uh, if you elect this option. The first one is that you have to auto-enroll. So auto-enrollment is a requirement. Uh, the QUACA contribution has to be at least 
3% up to a maximum of 50%, 15%. So you can choose what your default is. Um, it does, you are required to do um, auto escalation if the default rate is less than 6%, then you would have to auto, um, auto enroll participants or auto escalate them each year until they reach that 6%. Now, once they reach 6%, you can stop there or you can act, the employer can elect to continue with the auto escalation until they reach a maximum of 15%. Again, if you elect this option, all this would have to be drafted in the plan document. So it's something that you have to decide um, at the time of the amendment. It's not like you can decide each year, I'm going to do auto escalation in excess of 6%. It has to be drafted in the document uh, of what your decision is. Now, we do recommend that you confirm with your vendor, record keeper, um, if they can accommodate for auto escalation. Some record keepers do and some don't. So definitely get in touch with them if this is one of the options that you find interesting in adding into your plan. Okay, so now let's go over the withdrawal restrictions for safe harbor plans. First, um, you must be age 59 and a half to take a withdrawal or be a terminated employee to actually, you know, withdraw safe harbor contributions from the plan. Uh, second, if participants who have defaulted, enrolled in the QUACA option, can take a permissible withdrawal of their automatic, automatic contributions, and that's only within 90 days of being auto-enrolled. That's the only time they can actually withdraw their money from from the plan during that period. Next is the annual notification requirement. So all safe harbor plans uh, usually require uh, a notice to be distributed. The safe harbor status uh, it is a year-to-year -year election. So the notice, like I said, is given to all eligible participants, and that's usually uh, 30 days and no more than 90 days before the beginning of each safe harbor plan year. For those uh, new employees that are newly eligible to the, to the plan, they must be notified no later than their date of eligibility and no earlier than 90 days before their eligibility date starts. So the safe harbor notice is only required for the safe harbor match. It no longer is required for the safe harbor non-elective, but you can choose to continue distributing the notice for the safe harbor non-elective option. I found that at least some of my plans, they like to be consistent as in prior years and they have continued to distribute that notice. To those employees that notifies them what's allowed for the plan and gives them, you know, uh, it gives them information that they can contribute into the plan, how much the company is doing. So they have been continuing to, to distribute that notice. Okay, so now let's talk about what, what's actually in the notice. So first, the notice should include the safe harbor uh, formula that you're using, whether it's the safe harbor basic formula, the safe harbor enhanced match formula, or the QUACA. So whatever you, whatever option you're using, the safe harbor notice should definitely make a, will be listed on the actual notice. Uh, employee contribution limits, that should be listed on the notice as well. Uh, any other discretionary employee contributions, is listed on the notice, whether it be a discretionary match or discretionary employer profit sharing contribution, that will be listed on there as well. The plan name to which the contributions are being made. So the plan name is going to be on the notice. The plan's compensation definition is also uh, included in the notice, as well as any withdrawal provisions, restrictions, uh, that the plan may have is in the notice. 
Now the vesting information is also included and that's for all the contribution types that the plan allows, the safe harbor, the discretionary employee contributions, the vesting will be listed on there. Now the plan sponsors contact information in case the employee has questions should also be listed on there with their contact information. Okay, so now here's a couple of operation problems you should be aware uh, of and definitely try to avoid if you're a safe harbor plan. And these are some common ones that we've uh, seen. So the first one is safe harbor match contributions need to be limited limited due to the annual compensation cap. So for 2023, the cap compensation is 330,000. That means we will not take into consideration anything above that amount. So if any of the owners make above that, that amount, make sure that you just limit them to 330,000 when coming up with the calculation for their safe harbor match. Second, safe harbor contributions must be deposited to correct source type. So make sure you're make sure that when you're making that deposit to the investment company and you're making that contribution upload each payroll cycle, make sure that you elect the correct safe harbor contribution type. If you're doing a safe harbor match, make sure it's a safe harbor match. If you're doing a safe harbor uh, non-elective, make sure it's a safe harbor non-elective. If you're not sure on the actual type, definitely get in touch with your record keeper just to make sure that you're electing the, the right type. Sometimes you may have to add types and you have to prepare like a form if you don't have that option already in your plan. Um, and three, do not match the catch-up contributions separately from the regular employee deferral. So uh, going back to, I guess, the first problem that we've seen um, is the actual compensation limit. And like I said, the annual compensation limit for 2023 is just is 300, 330,000. 330, limit your calculation by just using the maximum amount if anybody exceeds that limit. Um, let's see. This is an IRS limit and may change from year to year. Uh, I think for 2022, the limit was 305,000. It did change for 2023, increasing it to 330,000. So that is the new limit for the 2023 plan year. NOVA will inform you of the new IRS limit and it usually takes place I'm not sure if it's gone out. It usually takes place around the fourth quarter of each year if the limits change for the upcoming year. So I don't think I've seen that yet, but if the limits change for 2024, nobody usually sends out like an email to all our clients making them aware. Okay, so let's go over uh, a compensation limit example. So ACME 401k plan makes a dollar for dollar safe harbor match of the first four contributed by employees. The maximum match any one employee can receive for the 2023 plan year would be 13,200. And how do you calculate that? Well, you take 330,000 times uh, the 4% and it should equal to 13,000 so any safe harbor match amounts over 3,200 will be forfeited along with any earnings or losses. Something important to note is that the annual compensation limit applies to non-safe harbor contributions as well. Okay, so second problem is depositing the safe harbor contributions into the wrong stores. Um, with that being said, 401k plans are legally required to separate accounts for different contribution types. It's very important that you deposit correctly at the investment company because distribution op options differ by 
source type. Um, the vaccine is different for each source. For example, the employee deferral is 100% vested. Your Roth, uh, Roth employee deferrals are 100% vested. Non-safe harbor match can have a vesting schedule tied to it. Check the document. Profit sharing has a vesting schedule tied to it as well. Safe harbor contributions are 100% vested with the exception of the quacka if you elect that option. That's if you like that option, that's usually 100% vested in year two. So it's, it's very important, just bottom line, it's very important that you deposit the contribution into the right source. Now, uh, third problem is um, making sure that uh, catch contributions are separated from their regular contributions. Um, Make sure to add the catch-up and the non-catch-up employee contributions together in determining the employee's deferral rate and the safe harbor match contributions um, in order to get the right calculation. Same thing applies for the Roth and non-Roth employee contributions. Okay, uh, if you do have uh, if you do have an incorrect match calculation, which you do, you, the plan sponsor will need to work with their payroll vendor, or if you run like payroll in-house, make sure you work with your internal person who at, who's actually running payroll to come up uh, with the calculation. Um, the tiered safe harbor match formula is a very is very uh, common in safe harbor contributions, but can sometimes be uh, difficult to calculate in the event you're not sure on how to calculate that safe harbor match contribution. I recommend getting with your account manager, go over a couple of people, make sure that you feel comfortable in calculating that contribution. That way going forward you have you make sure that you have the right calculation each time you submit payroll. Okay. You may be asking, is the safe harbor right for you? Is the safe harbor uh, plan right, right for you and your company? If any of the following actually apply, uh, you may want to consider having a safe harbor plan. So with that being said, one, do you, root, do you regularly uh, fail the ADP and ACP testing resulting in ACP refunds? Do you have low participation? participation rate from non-highly compensated employees? Do you have like a top-heavy plan? Do you want to bring key employees to the IRS maximum of 66,000? Um, are you already contributing employer contributions? Uh, and six, do you have a good steady cash flow and that you want to consider maybe becoming a safe harbor plan, um, giving your employees like a safe harbor contribution to help them towards their retirement. So some of these options, if, if you fall under one of these options, definitely consider, you know, becoming a safe harbor plan. And next is the common top heavy organizations that should also consider maybe adding the safe harbor feature if you don't have it. It's owner operated businesses, you know, businesses that are family ran, any medical and legal practices. Um, most of those are usually the small companies with few highly compensated owners and a small number of low wage staff, um, groups with low, non highly, comp non -highly compensated employees participating. Um, so most of these companies that I mentioned are small companies that usually have trouble passing testing uh, that might benefit from Safe Harbor, or like I said, if one of the key employees that they're top heavy, then they're already required to do a Safe Harbor notice, why not? Well, are required to do a top heavy contribution, why not be a Safe Harbor plan? So stuff to consider um, in, in deciding whether you wanna be a Safe Harbor plan. Okay, so ready to proceed. If you're ready to proceed for, with the safe harbor option for your 2024 plan year, 
make sure that you, if you want to adopt it for 2024, contact your account manager by November 3rd, uh, simply because we do need time to actually prepare the amendment by December 1st of 2023. Also remember that if you go with this option, we have to provide, we have, we have to prepare the notice and you have to provide the notice to the participants by December 1st of 2023. Um, allowing your participants to make new elections. Um, and you also have to make sure you notify your record keeper to set up the safe harbor contribution bucket for your plan, which would be new for 2024 if you're not already a safe harbor plan. And if you're changing from one safe harbor uh, formula to a different one, you may have to change that uh, bucket as well. And then notify your payroll contribution, your payroll department in regards to your new safe harbor contribution. Okay, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christine. Christina, it's all yours. All right. Um, can you see my screen, Lisa? Yes, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks so much. I do want to say I do have some storms going through my area. Hopefully I don't lose connection, but just wanted to, to let you all know in case it, it, it blanks out. Um, I want to wrap up our hour with talking about Nova's cybersecurity measures. Why this is so important is, and why it is part of this presentation is you can see that there's a lot of testing that's required. Um, of 401k plans. Even if your plan is a safe harbor plan, there's still some testing that is required. So if you're already a NOVA client, you know that on, a, on an annual basis, NOVA um, requests annual census data. And it's so important that this census data is accurate so that we can do the required testing accurately for you. Um, so, you know, when you get that request at the beginning of January, you want to make sure that the data that you're submitting to us is accurate. Um, we do ask that that information is submitted to us electronically. And we do have things in place to make sure that that is done securely because cyber threats are everywhere. So you never want to send sensitive data via email without encryption. And this includes census files, deferral files, payroll files, and address files. Never ever send them through regular email. Non-discrimination testing files, including the ADP test, the top heavy test, the 410B test, and the 414S testing contain sensitive information. Um, so we want to be careful with those, and that's why we don't at NOVA distribute those to you um, through email. Um, most software will mask Social Security numbers now, but not all. Some do. So we just want to be very careful with this. Um, we also want to be careful when we send um, distribution and loan forms to NOVA. You want to make sure that that's done securely because those forms often have the individual's social security number on it, name, address, date of birth, you know, everything that a bad guy could use um, against, that, you know, against that person. Um, you also don't want to, you know, tax forms. Don't send those through email. No W-2s, no K-1s, no Schedule Cs. And like I said, um, we do have a secure web portal um, through our plan sponsor link that you can use. And that is also how we do our annual census um, request through plan sponsor link. There's a secure file exchange feature also on plan sponsor link that allows you to um, send files securely to NOVA. And it also allows us to send files securely to you. Um, encryption software um, is on our emails. 
Um, so even though we're not sending this through email, we want to make sure that our emails are as secure as possible. NOVA also requires that in order to add any new contact for your plan, that we need to receive authorization from an existing contact. So that will protect that, you know, some random person can't just reach out and say, I work for so and so and I need contact for your plan. That would never happen. We need to first get um, a authorization from an existing contact before we add anyone. Um, NOVA requires that all of their employees um, receive quarterly training um, on cybersecurity and how to keep things um, safe in the cyber world. Um, so it's very important to us. And we also have a policy that passwords need to be changed on a quarterly basis. Um, we want to keep things secure. It, it's, it's so important. As we're wrapping things up here, I do want to remind you um, if you are here to get Texas CPA credit, please complete the evaluation form. A survey is going to pop up right after the webinar ends, and you'll receive your certification within a week via email. That takes us to the end, and we have about four minutes. Yvette, I don't know if we got any questions. We do not. Um, so unless you want to go over something else, I can go ahead and close out the session. No, um, let me just wrap up on this slide then. You know, if a question does come to mind, please contact your NOVA account manager. Um, they would be glad to help you. Like Lisa said, if you want to change your plan to a safe harbor plan, um, that really needs to be decided and final by November 3rd so that we can put everything into place for you um, in a timely manner. Um, if you're not a NOVA client and you have questions about safe harbor plans, please feel free to reach out to Lisa or me. Our contact information's there. And also want to remind you that NOVA frequently has webinars. They're all free and you can register on NOVA's website. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you have a great afternoon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa and Christine, uh, for your time today. And thanks again for everybody for joining. Um, just like she mentioned, if you want to register, you can follow us on our uh, website. If you want to view any webinars that you may have missed, um, you can view the recordings of those and the session on our YouTube channel, which is Nova 401k Associates or our website, uh, www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.